Okay, welcome everyone. Um, I think we'll we'll get going. There may be a few other people that continue to to join us, but um, we have a lot of material to cover today, so I think we'll we'll dive in. Uh, thank you for joining us. My name is Laura Gentile. I'm the Operations Director with the Cervix and Colon Screening Program at BC Cancer. And this is a webinar about the at-home cervix screening pilot. As we get started, I would first like to acknowledge, sorry, there we go. Here's my, my picture. This is the view that I get to see from my office every day. It's not the view that I have at home tonight, but um, this is uh, where I get to live, work and play. So as we get started, I'd first like to acknowledge the territories I'm calling in, in from, which are the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh tooth nations. I would also like to acknowledge the unceded and traditional lands of the Coast Salish and New Chalmuth peoples where this pilot project that we're talking about tonight will be taking place. And if you're calling in from any other areas, I also invite you to acknowledge the territory where you are. A few housekeeping things as we get started. The webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the BC uh, screening website for those that couldn't attend. I'll ask the panelists to please mute when you're not speaking and for the attendees to use the Q&A feature that's in Zoom to ask your questions. Um, the panelists will go through, will complete the webinar and have some time for discussion and um, we'll be using the Q&A feature to help answer questions about the talk tonight. There will be an evaluation that will be sent out by email and certificates for CME credits will be sent by mail for, um, for those who attend the live session. So on the docket for tonight, we're going to talk about HPV screening, some background and evidence. I'll give an overview of the pilot and Lori will talk about what your patients will probably want to know and we'll have some time for some questions and discussion. So we'll get started. I'd like to introduce Dr. Gina Ogilvie, Professor with Canadian Research Chair in HPV Control. And Dr. Ogilvie was also the PI for the HPV focal trial. And really the reason that we got this funding to be able to do this pilot here in BC. And Dr. Dirk Van Niekerk is the medical director for the cervix screening program and has been involved uh, for a long time in talking about how we will transition over from pap tests to HPV primary screening in BC. So I welcome both of you. Uh, thanks so much, Laura. And I'll take the next slide, please. It's a real pleasure to be here tonight. And we're really excited to talk to you about this uh, project. And as Laura, Laura kindly didn't say how long we've been working on this in too much detail, but uh, it's really nice to come to fruition. So by the end of today's session, we really want to make sure that you really have a great understanding of the case for change. So why we want to propose this uh, at-home cervix screening program using HPV self-collection. And what you're going to, well, what I'm going to particularly talk about, as well as uh, Dr. Van Niekirk, is really the high quality evidence we have to support a transition from pap test to HPV testing for cervix screening. You're going to understand that actually patient collected samples are uh, as accurate as provider collected samples for HPV testing. Uh, we hope you, you leave with a good understanding of the extended screening interval, why that is being recommended, and how that's actually safe, very safe uh, for screening uh, this screening program. And also give you a sense of, of why self-collection actually reduces barriers to screening and can actually improve participation and actually equity in screening. And it particularly because it addresses things such as folks for folks who have uh, barriers to screening and particularly pelvic examinations to his, due to histories of trauma and cultural sensitivities. And for folks who've had difficulty accessing primary care providers, folks who've had difficulty getting pap screening appointments and as well how it enables screening for unattached patients. Next slide, please. 
So particularly tonight, we're going to get into some key learning objectives and what you're going to be able to do is understand who we're identifying as eligible for the at-home uh, cervix screening program, uh, to recognize when and what kind of follow-up will be required for pilot participants, have a good understanding of the tools and resources that are available for patients and providers. And also we'll hear about the common question from patients and how to support patients through their screening journey. And I really just want to flag, we're going to talk about HPV focal and Laura's already uh, sort of mentioned it earlier on, but we do in this team actually have a lot of experience using HPV testing as a primary screen. So we do have a lot of confidence in our, our ability to be able to, to move to this new technology really effectively and safely. Next slide, please. So a reminder that to HPV, uh, the human papilloma virus, there's about 150 genotypes, uh, but about 40, what we say preferentially affect the anogenital region. So that's primarily the milieu where they thrive and are able to reproduce. Uh, of those 40, about 15 are oncogenic and associated with cervical, vulvar, vaginal, penile, and anal cancer. And uh, particularly as we drill down to cervix cancer and cervical cancer, oncogenic HPV is associated with over 99% of cervical cancer cases globally. So we call it uh, but the necessary but insufficient cause of cervical cancer. So it needs to be there for people to develop uh, cervix cancer. Next slide, please. Uh, HPV is the most common STI uh, globally, and it's transmitted uh, sexually through intimate skin-to-skin uh, -skin contact, not necessarily intercourse. And what we know is that any sexually active person is at risk for HPV. Really, it's more of a marker of sexual activity than anything else. And uh, about 80% of sexually active people at some point in their life will be exposed to HPV. Uh, we know that the folks who are at higher risk of HPV acquisition are those who are newly sexually active and young adults who tend to have the most dense sexual networks and the most uh, partner exchange. Uh, but the good thing is that even though there's, it's highly prevalent and a lot of uh, folks acquire it, the majority of newly acquired cases resolve uh, within one to two years and most are asymptomatic. So, so the, although the majority resolve, because it's such a prevalent infection, we still have lots of, of women who uh, have this infection and then uh, it transitions as we go forward. We'll talk about that. Next slide, please. What we're not gonna spend as much time on, but just so we touch on it, is that of low risk HPV, which is associated with anogenital warts. Uh, so HPV type six and 11. Um, it, it, this is not associated with cancer. Um, there are some testing platforms that include a low risk. We won't be, we're not including that. This is not what we're gonna be focusing on because we're doing this because we are interested in understanding and preventing and eliminating cervical cancer. However, uh, many people ask about it. So we just wanted to flag that uh, many females who develop visible anogenital warts may have difficulty clearing uh, HPV and need to just be encouraged to continue on their regular screening journey. And as you know, uh, although uh, any of general warts may recede and may not be seen, some folks can still transmit those to their partners. Next slide, please. So let's focus a bit here on the oncogenic HPV. As I mentioned, there are about 15 types, and these are associated with various cancers, if not spontaneously um, cleared. What, what I was mentioning is that uh, young folks acquire the HPV infection, and usually it clears. But for those who it doesn't clear in, uh, within about 10, 10 years, it may start to persist and change the cells in the cervix that lead to cervical cancer. So high-risk HPV types 16 and 18 cause about 70% of cervical cancer and precancerous lesions around the world. And in Canada, uh, an estimated uh, 1,350 uh, were diagnosed with cervical cancer. And you know the way I like to phrase this is every year, about once a day, a woman of reproductive age dies from an entirely preventable cancer. So this is really something that we can address and why we're so interested and passionate about this. Next slide, please. 
So just a reminder, not to go too deeply into the pathology, but uh, just a reminder that part of what happens is when uh, an individual comes in contact with the virus, there's, if there's a tear in the, in the cervix, which is commonly occurs with uh, sexual intercourse, particularly in younger folks, the virus can then enter and infect at the basement membrane. And that can lead to, in, when it's, the infection is persistent, to changes, morphologic changes in the uh, cells of the cervix. Next slide, please. And so as we discussed, there's sort of a natural history. By and large, the majority of HPV infections that lead to cervix cancer are acquired at a younger age, uh, so sort of before 30. Um, and you can see here what happens is, is, is young women acquire HPV infection and a large percentage of them clear. But there's a percentage who don't clear that infection. And those individuals go on to develop precancer and then a percentage of those then go on to develop um, cancer. What pap tests do, as you can see in here, is you, they're looking for changes in the cell. Whereas what an HPV test is doing is looking for evidence of the HPV infection. And what we're trying to do is identify those precancerous lesions more efficiently so we can then send women on for colposcopy and treatment. So I think that's, that's a nice sort of picture that actually shows what happens. The other thing I'll just mention here, of course, is the vaccination. And we'll talk about it with the next slide, but vaccination actually prevents that HPV infection from happening. Next slide, please, Laura. So cervix cancer is almost entirely preventable through two things. One, primary prevention, second, secondary prevention. Primary prevention is the vaccine. Uh, HPV vaccine is ideally given before uh, individuals become sexually active and are exposed because it is a preventive vaccine. And we know that we get the most robust immune response uh, under the age of 15, but it's still actually effective if given later. But again, it's a preventive, not therapeutic vaccine. So once a person has an HPV infection, the vaccine does not get rid of it. Um, it is also recommended post-treatment. So once a woman has had the, the cervical dysplasia excised, which likely is what hosts uh, the HPV uh, infection, a vaccine does reduce the recurrence uh, as well of precancerous lesions. But today what we're going to focus on is secondary prevention, which is screening, which is, with, which is detecting and treating precancer before it's invasive. Why is that important? because we know the vast majority of women in British Columbia right now have, were, would not have been eligible for the HPV vaccine. So they need screening. So what we wanna do is optimize the screening pathway for them. Next slide, please. So, so we've been really fortunate with pap screening. There's no doubt it's, all, it's been an important tool that has helped us detect those precancerous lesions. But the truth of the matter is actually in and of itself, an, a pap test actually has quite a low sensitivity and actually quite a low negative predictive value. So the way we accommodated for that was actually those frequent testing, because really a, a more robust screening tool, you would not have to repeat it as frequently as we've had to. So in contrast to, to pap smears, what HPV testing does, that detection of that HPV test, actually detects the presence of HPV DNA through molecular testing. And the sensitivity of that is much higher, about 90%, and has a much higher negative predictive value. What does that mean? When an individual is negative for HPV, their likelihood of developing a precancerous lesion down the road is significantly lower. That's perfect for screening modality. That's what we want when we're creating a screening program. The other thing compared to a PAP where you, you know, have to visualize, visualize the cervix, you gotta visualize the junction, you gotta take a sample from the junction. If you can't see the junction, you need to use a cytobrush. You don't have to do that with HPV testing. You can actually just get a self-collected vaginal sample because it is in the, the vaginal secretions and you detect the HPV in those secretions. This allows for women themselves to get a, a sample and does not require a practitioner to get that sample. Next slide, please. So uh, we've alluded to this briefly, and I'm just going to quickly talk about HPV focal, which was the largest uh, North American randomized control trial uh, evaluating primary HPV testing for screening. And what we did was we compared primary HPV testing every uh, four years compared to cytology every two years. Over 25,000 women participated in British Columbia from between 2008 and 2016. Next slide, please. 
And the outcomes, we're looking at precancerous lesions detected at 48 months uh, in the control arm and in the intervention arm. We also looked at pre, uh, CIN2 as well as CIN3. We also looked at use of colposcopy as well as cost effectiveness. Next slide, please. So what, what did we find? We found that the use of primary HPV testing compared to cytology resulted in significantly lower likelihood of CIN3. So by using HPV early on as a screen, women were significantly less likely to detect and have, have CIN3 later on. We also found that with one single negative HPV test that was highly protective and indicated women were very unlikely to develop CIN3 up to seven years following, seven years. And finally, in a Cochrane review of over 40 studies, it showed that HPV testing is substantially less likely to miss CIN2 and CIN3 compared to PAPS. Next slide, please. And this is just one of the Kaplan-Meier curves, again, showing you that the uh, HPV testing detected those lesions earlier, which then protected women from having lesions that had, had been untreated longer, increasing the likelihood of developing cervix cancer. Next slide, please. And I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Ben Niker. Uh, yes, thank you, Gina. Thank you very much for that great overview of uh... HPV in cervical screening and the HPV focal trial, of which I was a part as well. I like to say I was the control arm of that of that study, <laughs> the, the cytology-based testing. Um, so, because we can, because HPV testing uh, does not have to be collected directly from the squamous columnar junction, it opens up uh, uh, possibilities for screening that we don't have with PAP testing. So there's the possibility of doing HPV testing beyond a clinician collected sample in an office setting um, to increase uh, reach and coverage. Uh, and as you can imagine, it also is the ideal type of screening test to have during a, COVID, a pandemic like COVID where you don't actually have to go to an office to get a sample collected. Um, and uh, very reassuring HPV testing on self-collected samples provides almost identical results to provider collected samples. Uh, and there was a very large meta-analysis by Mark Arben's group in Belgium that showed this. Um, and also, as you can imagine, it, it is generally a very well um, uh, received by women who are offered self-collection because they can do this in, in the privacy of their own homes. They don't have to make an appointment for uh, a HPV uh, screening collected sample and several countries including Australia and the Netherlands are currently offering self-collection in their national programs for uh, hard to reach or underscreened women. Um, move to the next slide. Uh, there is also the Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technologies and Healthcare which is a sort of um, arm's length organization that does uh, evaluation of various drugs and technologies in healthcare. They had a report in 2019 looking at HPV primary screening for cervical uh, cancer screening. And they said there was uh, showed high to high or fair to high agreement between self and clinician collected samples. That sounds, uh, it's actually mostly really high if you look at the actual studies. And because cell sampling is more convenient for patients, cell sampled HPV tests may increase participation rates in the screen screening program. So, so from CADETH as well, an endorsement essentially of uh, HPV self collection. Next slide. Uh, so this is just an overview of the pilot we're planning. So essentially, to uh, and just follow from the top then. So the age uh, group that we're including is age 25 to 69, HPV test every five years. And so at, so the initial test would be either negative, and if it's negative, we would just screen every five years. And I'll show some data to show that that is safe to do. Uh, if they are positive, and so the test we're using is, is a test that can separate uh, test for 14 high-risk HPV types, but can separate out HPV type 16 and 18, which are which have a higher risk of having an abnormality than the other types. So if somebody is positive for either type 16 or 18, they will go straight to colposcopy because the, the risk is high enough to warrant that. Uh, and if they're 
positive for the 12 for one of the 12 other HPV types, they will have a primary care uh, provider pap test. So they would make an appointment, go for a pap test, which will be read in our laboratory. And depending on the result of that pap test, uh, if they have any abnormalities, so ask us atypical squamous cells of undetermined significance or higher or low grade, uh, anything worse than that, they will go to colposcopy. If it's negative, there'll be a repeat HPV test at 12 months and some of the stories. So at that time, if the HPV test is positive um, for 16 or 18, they go to colposcopy. If it's negative, they'll go to the next screening round, which I guess would be in four years. And then if it's positive for any other, any of the other 12 IRS types, they'll have a, a physician collected pap test uh, and colposcopy because uh, if the HPV has been uh, persistent for 12 months, we feel that they're not going to clear their virus and the risk is then still is actually high enough for uh, um, a referral to colposcopy, but it does help in the colposcopy assessment to have that HPV, uh, that uh, back test result. Uh, so if you go to the next slide. Um, so the following groups will not be eligible for at-home screening. Uh, pregnancy, two reasons really. The one is we don't really have good data on, on that subset of, of pe uh, people who are pregnant, so we don't know how well it works. We have no reason to think it won't work. The other thing is just that if there is a coincidental adverse outcome that has nothing to do with the HPV self-collection, the, there is the concern that it might be ascribed to that HPV self-collection you know, inadvertently sampling from the inner cervical canal and so forth. But uh, there is really no evidence to show that that is a problem. But for now, we will not um, include pregnant uh, patients in the study. If they are, if they later prove to be pregnant, I don't think it's a problem. It's just that upfront, we will not be offering it. Uh, for immunocompromised uh, Participants uh, and those um, either HIV or solid organ transplant recipients on, on immunosuppression. The problem is they have a very high rate of HPV positivity. HPV testing in that setting has, has an even lower positive predictive value. So first of all, many of them have abnormal screening results. Their risk profile is not the same as it is for people who are not immunocompromised. So it's, it's not as well Established that HPV <clears throat> screening is is the correct thing, uh, it's the correct test in that setting, and maybe more importantly, there's insufficient longitudinal data to support that extended screening interval to five years. So they should continue to have their annual PAP tests as they have to do now, and then also for uh, those who've had treatment for cervical precancers, uh, adenocarcinoma in site two or CI in two or three in the last five years. Again, it's probably a good test to do in that setting. We do, we do actually do a physician collected um, HPV test in the setting, but we don't really have good enough data to show that, that self-collection is as predictive in this um, group. It, it likely is, but we just don't know. Next slide. So this is data from the HPV focal trial. I, I think you could just look at the left side of the graph. So this is CIN3 risk over time. The baseline is when somebody had, so zero is when somebody had their first test. The bottom set of lines are, are the ones who had an HPV test. So if you're HPV negative, your risk of developing CIN3 is really, really low until about you know, 48 months. And then it only rises very slowly. The, the left side of the graph, the sort of greenish color, is somebody who's had a negative cytology sample. And as you can see, their risks start going up at 24 months. And even at 36 months, which is our current screening interval, their risk is higher than, than somebody who had a, a negative HPV test at you know, 50 months. Um, so it really shows that it, that it is actually safer than, than our current practice. So, and then the next slide shows something very similar. This is just a longer term follow up. And again, you can see at six years, the risk is still extremely low for this is for CIN2, but it's similar for CIN3. Uh, it goes up a little quicker 
for younger women. So if you see that red line, that's women 25 to 34. So the risk raise, uh, goes up sooner, but still at five years, very safe. And uh, next slide. Yeah, so I hope we've, we've convinced you uh, that there is high quality evidence to support a transition from PAP test to HPV testing. Uh, the, the, the patient collected vaginal sample is as accurate as the provider collected sample. Uh, I do have, have a graph if there's a follow-up question, and that means we can extend the screening interval, which makes screening more efficient, uh, fewer tests, uh, more less frequent screening. And of course, uh, it would make sense that that would reduce barriers to screening because the uh, people who have a history of trauma and cultural sensitivities might not want to have a pelvic exam for screening. Uh, so those who have a difficulty accessing a, a primary care provider during COVID or don't have a primary care provider, this enables screening for them or, or people who are waiting long to have pap test appointments because there's such a backlog in, in getting Baptist appointments, and uh, sorry, I made this point earlier, enable screening for people who are currently unattached, don't have a family um, care provider. Uh, next slide, I think, is handing over to Laura then. Thanks, Laura. Great, so I'm gonna talk um, uh, about the, the pilot, I'll give you a bit of an overview. And so the purpose of the at-home cervix screen pilot is really to establish and test the system level changes that are going to be needed to make a change like this. And it's quite significant. We have been working for um, almost a year on the patient and provider materials. And so th those things are coming along, but um, also need to practice our engagement strategies at a community level. We'll be looking to optimize invitation, recall, and result notification letters, just in terms of timing and content. And we really have to practice that to see what we get and, and adjust things as we go. And, and so the pilot helps us do that. And there's lots of work for us to do within our IT system to be ready to uh, request kits to be mailed out and receive HPV test results and send letters to patient and providers. And then also making sure that the, the colposcopists are ready with um, appropriate guidelines for follow-up. So for the pilot, we plan to evaluate um, the response to at-home cervix screening, so an um, uptake and, and follow-up response in three different cohorts. The first is the never screened or not screened in more than 10 years. The second cohort is those that are under screened or haven't been screened in five to nine years. And then those patients that are due now, so have participated in screening in the past and are ready to screen again. And we will test direct mailing kits as well as uh, offering patients to request a kit and have one mailed to them. So um, these are our different cohorts and um, the cohorts one and two will both have pre-invite letters that will be sent to them. And then depending on which arm they get randomized to, either they'll be sent an invitation to request a kit or their pre-invite letter will let them know that in a few weeks time, a kit will arrive for them. For our recall group, we will also trial just sending uh, a kit when someone's due to screen again. And so I think the important part here is that the experience that your patients will have with the pilot may be different. So we will um, um, either be mailing kits or patients will have to call and ask for them. And then as we get some information in the early days of the pilot, we will also be adjusting letter content or the timing of when letters goes, those kinds of things. So there'll be some moving pieces in these early days. This is what the kit looks like. And it is, um, it's a folder that um, uh, the team at BC Cancer has designed and has a place on the left side for a brochure and the instructions, uh, right here, brochure and the instructions. And then at the spine, the sample collection device, and then the return mailing envelope. And I can show you here, this will be the, um, the collection device. It's a, a Copan flock swab. It uh, comes apart fairly easily. There's a red mark, hopefully you can see it there, 
where um, the swab is held and, and then um, inserted and turned and then uh, gets put back in um, into the device and mailed back. So that's what you can expect in terms of the kit itself from the, the program. We've been also working on developing instructions for the kit, so quite detailed instructions. We really want people to have confidence in doing the test at home. And we did some focus testing on these instructions earlier in the spring, made some adjustments, and we have about 30 to 40 kits that are out right now with some focus group um, patients where they're going to do the test at home and, and give us some feedback on the instructions. So that's a work in progress. And of course, I know once we get the kits in the mail in a higher volume, we'll continue to hear feedback and these, these will continue to be adjusted as we go. We have developed some brochures for patients. So one is a general at-home screening brochure uh, talking about uh, at-home screening and then another brochure on the results that someone could expect with at-home cervix screening. We have three videos that have been developed for patients. Uh, again, one a general uh, video about at-home cervix screening, a video on uh, the instructions for completing the test at home, and then a video on results. And so all of these will be available to people participating in the pilot to support them. There will be correspondence that we send directly to patients. And so this will look like pre-invite, invite and recall notice letters. There will also be a letter and a requisition that will be included with the kits that we mail out. Patients will receive results letters as well. And then we'll be evaluating the, uh, the program throughout the process. In terms of um, the primary care provider role in the pilot, I think um, we can expect that invited patients will ask you about the pilot and whether they should participate. And some patients may ask for help with completing the kit. So we would um, ask that you encourage patients who are eligible and who've been offered at home cervix screening to complete the self collection um, themselves and return it. And if a patient brings in an at-home cervix screening kit, you can provide instructions and um, a place for them to take their own sample, or you can use the at-home cervix screening kit to take the sample for the patient that would work too. And you can return those completed samples just with the, in the same way that you would send a PAP test to the cervix, cervical cancer screening laboratory. And patients may have questions about their results and they may need an appointment with you to talk about that. We expect that about 7% of patients will have an HPV other high risk positive results and will need a, a PAP test from a primary care provider. So you'll receive that information through the HPV laboratory test result with a recommendation on it for a PAP test if that's what's um, being recommended. And, uh, and then for patients that have an HPV 16 and or 18 positive result, they'll be uh, recommended for colposcopy. And the facilitated referral process that exists now when patients are recommended for colposcopy will continue for these patients too. But I think we can expect that because we're reaching out to patients that have never participated in cervix screening or haven't in a while, that there are probably reasons for them personally on, on why they've not participated and they may need some additional support to access the follow-up that's recommended for them. And I think the primary care providers will play an important role uh, in, in those discussions with patients. We can expect through the pilot that there'll be some patients who don't have a primary care provider, which is just the nature when we start to invite people that haven't participated before, we don't know who their primary care provider is some of the time. And there are, of course, many patients who just don't have a primary care provider at this point. And I think one of the most important opportunities with at-home cervix screening is to be able to reduce barriers and improve access to screening. And, um, and so making this test accessible for people that don't have an active primary care provider is, uh, is an opportunity that we can offer. And so we've been doing some work with the participating divisions and have identified clinics in the community where we, we can link that um, patient who has a, an HPV positive 
result with a clinic to help them get the support or the pap test or follow up that they need through the pilot. So those discussions, we have more discussions happening with the clinics that have um, volunteered to support that process. To help you in your discussions with patients, we have created a provider guide. And this is structured in such a way that there's a, a topic, a question, an answer, and then uh, some detailed information about what the evidence says, as well as some key messages that you can use to answer questions that your patients may have. And uh, a draft of this um, has been available for a bit. Hopefully you got the link to the, the Dropbox to be able to see it. And new versions will be coming out shortly. But I think this is a really important part of the pilot. How well do these types of tools work for you? Do you like them? Does it contain the information that, that you want and that you need? What are we missing? What should we do more of? What should we do less of? So we really appreciate your feedback as you start to use some of these tools. There will also be correspondence to providers uh, throughout the, the pilot. And uh, certainly, I think at least in the early days, and we'll get your feedback on this as we get going, um, but when we invite a participant um, to, per to participate in the pilot, um, if we have a primary care provider on file, we'll notify you that your patient has been invited, just so you can support those conversations and know that that has happened. You will also receive HPD, HPD test results directly from the lab. So just like you do other lab results at this point in time. And if a patient has been recommended for colposcopy due to an HPV 16 and or 18 positive result, you'll receive the notice of referral for colposcopy. You'll also receive reminder notices if a patient was recommended for a pap test and one hasn't been received within a certain amount of time. And similarly, if a patient was recommended for colposcopy and we haven't received that colposcopy or treatment report, then we'll reach out uh, to ask what's happened for that patient. There will be patients that will have uh, HPV test result that's invalid or they, the lab was unable to test the specimen. And for those patients, when we receive that invalid or unable to test result, we will send a kit out to the patient once we receive that. So you'll get a notice that that kit has gone out for those patients so that you're aware that uh, a repeat kit has been offered to the patient. And I'll pass it over now to Lori Smith. Lori is a registered nurse with a certified practice. She's the research manager for HPV related diseases, and cancer control research. She was uh, the, the frontline lead for the HPV focal trial, um, doing a lot of that operations work and is currently leading the cervix check self-collection research project, which is occurring in some communities of BC. And as part of her practice, Lori provides PAP tests as well. So I'll hand it over to Lori. Thanks, Laura. Um, as you can imagine uh, with this, massive change to screening, uh, people will have questions. And in BC, we are fortunate to have had a, a lot of real world experience with HPV testing, as Gina said earlier, with the focal study and with our self-collection projects. And through screening thousands of women over the last several years, we've logged questions and have crafted responses based on feedback. So we feel, um, confident in a lot of the uh, work that's gone into the pamphlets that uh, and the materials that Laura has described in hoping that we've anticipated these questions and will help prepare people uh, as this project rolls out. But there's two general themes and the first is questions people have about HPV testing itself and then of course when people get HPV positive results it opens up a different set of questions. Next. So the main questions uh, that involve testing are what is HPV? What has it got to do with cervical cancer? Why do we need to change? This has been working, why do we need to change? What's the difference between HPV and PAP testing? And I would say the most frequently asked question it surrounds the interval of five years. Uh, people think that when you do something less frequently, it must mean they're getting less care. Next. 
So as Gina mentioned at the beginning, um, just kind of reinforcing the prevalence of HPV. HPV is the very is a very common STI. Most sexually active people will be exposed to it. So we encourage normalizing HPV and um, some language that we found work is just kind of calling it the common cold of the genital region that just helps reframe for some people. Uh, people need to realize HPV has always been the cause of cervical cancer and abnormal PAPs, but now we actually have the ability to identify if HPV is pre present and identifying women at risk for cell changes earlier and better. And the PAP, well, whereas the PAP has already identified changes that have occurred and reassuring people that most HPV infections are harmless and transient and will go away on their own. Next. And then these next points really again surround that, uh, the concerns people have about the extended interval. Um, as Gina mentioned, we know that when someone is HPV negative, we have great confidence that no precancer cells uh, or cancer cell changes have occurred. HPV testing is very good at detecting what it's meant to detect. And because of this, we can extend that interval. And this is something people can relate to is that HPV testing every five years is as safe as a pap smear every three years. And cervical cancer takes many years to develop. The reason the PAP test is done every two to three years is really to improve its performance and make sure it doesn't miss anything, not because cell changes happen quickly. In my experience, this is one thing that was very surprising to people and really reassured them knowing this. And like most things we use, technology changes and improves. So the PAP has been around since the 60s. So I often tell people to look around their house and ask, uh, ask them if there's anything from the 60s they still use that they rely on and, and um, you know, why can't our health technology change as well? Next, some self-collection specific questions. Um, as Dirk talked about some of this, women will have the same questions. Is this as accurate as having my doctor take the sample? Yes, uh, the research has shown that it is as good. Will it hurt? Um, Laura showed you the, the swab. It's basically a, a Q-tip with an elongated stem with the line on it so that people can't insert it too, too far. What if I do it wrong? Um, the, there's different instructions in the written, the, the video, um, they're very simple to follow. And as Dirk also mentioned, because this sample doesn't have to be taken from the uh, cervix and it only needs to be rotated around the vagina, it's, it's very accurate. And actually at the laboratory, we rarely ever get an invalid self-collected sample. Next. And then of course, um, when a person gets HPV positive results, this does open up another set of questions for them. Uh, the main ones again are, does this mean I have cervical cancer? Will I get cervical cancer? How could I possibly have HPV? I've been with the same partner for years, or on the other hand, I've only had one partner. How can I have HPV? Uh, infidelity questions often arise. Has my partner been cheating on me or will my partner think I've been cheating on them? Um, who gave this to me? When did I catch it? People start sleuthing into their history to see where they got it from. And do I need to tell my partner about it? How do I tell my partner about it? And does my partner need to be tested? Next. So again, some key messages. Telling people that HPV doesn't indicate they have or will develop cervical cancer, as we've said, it may disappear on its own. This HPV result just ensures that a person is getting appropriate follow-up and often earlier than they would have if they had an abnormal pap smear. Um, we can't emphasize enough telling people how common HPV is, emphasizing the prevalence, normalizing it, um, reminding them most people will be exposed at some point in their lives. And really it isn't possible to know who gave it to you or when you caught it as the, the natural history slides show you can get it years and years ago. And it certainly doesn't indicate promiscuity or infidelity. Uh, the inf infection um, is often passed back and forth between partners. So it's really not possible to determine who, who caught it first in the relationship. And it's not to be considered the same as other STIs like um, chlamydia and gonorrhea, where partner notification, testing and treatment is required. There's really um, no medical case uh, for telling uh, a partner about HPV. Next. 
yeah, so it, partner notification is really a personal choice. And if they do choose to tell their partner, um, they may ask for guidance on what to tell them, um, making sure to arm them with no blame, shame type of conversation. Uh, it's, it's actually, it's, instead of, uh, it's safe to assume most people are exposed and it's actually um, unrealistic to assume that it's possible to avoid coming into contact with HPV. And there's no way to determine when it was passed or by whom. For testing, a lot of women had questions about should their partner get tested? And there is no approved HPV test for men. Uh, HPV testing is done to really assess the risk of cervical cancer. Males don't have the same risks um, on the epithelium, the way HPV infects the basement membrane. Um, but just to note, this does not apply to MSM who have receptive anal sex and that, that's a different conversation, but just uh, we found that a lot of heterosexual couples have questions for their, for their male partners. Um, we hope that you know, the provider document that's been prepared also um, will help inform these conversations with your patients. Uh, so uh, Laura, I'll pass it back to you to start the discussion. Oh, you're on mute. Thank you for telling me. Um, through the Zoom function, there is a, a, a Q&A uh, functionality. If you have any questions for any of the panelists, I'm happy to, to talk about that. And um, I see one here in the chat from, from someone. If someone opts to get their HPV vaccine after exposure to HPV, uh, with the potential for having latent 16, 18, or other high-risk variants, does the vaccine suppress viral expression as it relates to dysplasia? Yes, I'll have Gina. You yeah, I can, yeah, I can jump on that. So, so again, how the vaccine works is we, we give it usually for adults with three doses, for people under 15, two doses. For adults, it's zero to six months. Um, usually we see some antibody response within sort of two to three weeks. So certainly we don't use it like a post-exposure prophylaxis, which is sort of what I think you're describing here as we do say with HIV, with PEP or, or NPEP. Um, and then further to this, um, if someone already has dysplasia and gets the vaccine, it will not address the that specific um, sort of uh, dysplasia. If you treat their dysplasia and give them a vaccine, it, there is a reduced chance that they will have a recurrence of that dysplasia. That's likely because we're actually preventing them from reacquiring HPV from their partner. That's probably the most likely reason why that vaccine works in that setting. That said, the, what the, the, there's also a benefit of that vaccine because it will prevent them also from acquiring any other HPV type should they have another partner, et cetera. So there is some benefit for sure uh, to get a vaccine post-treatment. Uh, post but again, the optimal time is really early on grade six, it was, which is when our BC program is. Why? Because one, young people have the most robust antibody responses, and two, we give it before the majority of, of folks have started their sexual uh, lives. So that's that's where we want want to do. Okay, there uh, aren't other questions in the Q and A or on the chat. Um, I realized as I was going through. Um, my discussion about the, the cohorts and who will be invited that I didn't talk about age. And so I just want to just go back up here. And in terms of who we're going to start with. So I showed you this slide with the, the cohorts. And uh, in each of these cohorts, our initial target is going to be to try and invite people who are in their zero and five ending age years, so 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, that, um, that sort of thing. And what we're wanting to do with that is that as we transition from a three-year interval with a screening test to five, we want to be able to even out screening year over year. That's better for us, the system. And, um, and also, um, um, 
we are seeing that patients are uh, returning less frequently. The, the retention rate that we're seeing since pap tests went to from two years to three years is, is lower. And we think that that has something to do with the patients remembering when their last pap test was. So we'd like to work towards building some messaging around screening in your zero and five ages. So we'll start with that um, and, and see, see how we go. Um, there is a, a question here just sort of about the timelines of the pilot and when letters will start to go out and how long the pilot will last. And uh, so we're, we're readying our systems. We're very close to being ready to send out letters. We're waiting on, on two things. Uh, one of them, the validation in the lab is completing. So that's some work that has to happen to ready the lab. And also uh, our own IT systems, there's still some building that's happening with that. I think realistically at this point, we'd be, we wouldn't be looking to send letters until probably the end of October. And as we get more clarity on the timing of when we can do that, we will certainly be circling back and trying to keep you up to date with what that looks like so you know when to expect these questions to start to come. Before we get to the point of the letters going out, there will be a package of materials that will be made available to you so that you have access to brochures and the provider guide and uh, samples of other materials and letters, that sort of thing to, to help you. And how long will it last, uh, Laura? Oh. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Um, I, I avoided that, that one, I guess, because uh, I, I'm not sure. I think um, certainly uh, into next year, I mean, we're already in, in November. It depends on really how quickly um, we pace the letters going out. And there's a few different strategies that we'll take with that. Uh, we'd like to be able to send enough in the system to get enough going through the system to see what people's experiences are and what questions come up and really test the, the system. And, um, but also um, make sure that, you know, we, we have time to try new things and try again. So I, I can expect that sort of this will run through next year. And um, Someone is asking about how patients will be chosen to participate. And so our first, uh, our first round of, um, of identifying patients to participate will be everybody who lives in the target communities who, um, who meets the cohort criteria. So never screened, under screened or due for screening who's in their zero or five ages. That's, um, that's how we'll get started. And we intend to include uh, everybody in their zero and five ages who meets this, this cohort one, two, and three criteria um, uh, for sure in the pilot and, and hopefully a next age round as well for next year. Uh, there's another question about, um, about if patients will get their own results. Yes. Uh, I'll, um, just looking at Dirk a bit, but the results I think will, will be shared to my eHealth. I'm, I'm assuming that will happen. Is that true, Dirk? Yeah, like what, what I think uh, Compass it's called now used to be right. my eHealth. Yeah, so people who are signed up for that will get their results uh, through that portal. And it's also our intention to mail results at this time. Um, I'm not sure we'll, you know, we'll be evaluating um, that experience for people of receiving their results. And we'll adjust that as we go, but um, for sure patients who have a HPV positive result will definitely get a letter and it will articulate what their follow-up recommendations are. And I see, I think another question in the chat. So I'm just looking at that. So uh, in the colposcopy clinic, HPV testing results are often reported with the disclaimer that the specimen was contaminated with blood and that the results may not be accurate. Are self-collection results affected if patients are menstruating at the time of collection? Yes, I could grab that one. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we, we will be reporting if, if the, the um, swab was grossly uh, showed blood staining. So there is the possibility that, they'll, that they might be inaccurate, but 
but mainly, I guess we also forgot to mention that the the test we're using is a PCR-based assay that also shows uh, has an internal control built in, so it has as a housekeeping gene, the beta globin gene. So, so that gives us a lot more, lot more confidence that if the sample is negative, it's truly negative because it'll show the DNA, it'll show the internal control positive result. So it's really more when, when the test is in, more likely to be invalid when it's um, uh, when it's contaminated with blood. Uh, there is some evidence that, that HPV shedding goes along, uh, that, that there's sort of a, a linkage between the menstrual cycle and HPV shedding, but I don't think enough to really influence the, the results. And with HPV focal, for instance, we did not specifically uh, ask people to collect the sample at a specific time during their menstrual cycle. So I don't think the, the evidence is strong enough that it really influences it in in any meaningful way. Kirk, I could also add that the instructions that are provided and in the video and the printed instructions, it does tell people not to collect their sample when they're actively menstruating to just wait until they're finished to collect the sample. Which is a little bit easier with a self-collected sample mm -hmm. where you can just wait until you, it's ready to be uh, collected as opposed to timing your, uh, your office visit. Okay, I don't see um, other questions coming in. Uh, I've posted my email address and my it's my cell phone number. Um, this is um, this is an important piece of work that we're embarking on, and we really need to hear how it's going. So I offer you to contact me at any point in time. I'm happy to hear about the things that are going well and the things that aren't going well, things that are missing, um, things, suggestions that you have on uh, materials, um, things that we've missed that patients are concerned about that we're not answering well. All of those things are important. And this is really the chance to, to do it and, and try to do the best job that we can. So um, feel free to take that down or uh, you can reach out through the, the screening uh, programs um, just generally uh, on our website there's contact information there and, and you can always find me and if I don't have the answers to your questions and I'll we'll work to connect you to the right people. So thank you very much for participating tonight and your time. I'd like to thank Dr. Van Niekirk, Dr. Ogilvy and Lori for your time tonight and uh, and sharing all your experience and knowledge. Thank you. Have a good night. <laughs>